Welcome to updates from this European Society of Cardiology Scientific Sessions for the American Heart Association. My name is Manesh Patel, I'm at Duke University, and I'm joined with a, a friend and a colleague, uh, Christine Albert. Christine, you want to introduce yourself, and then we'll get going into some of the science. Yeah, well, thanks for asking me to join you this morning. It's Christine Albert from Cedar sinai I'm Chair of Cardiology there. Fantastic. Well, you know, like a lot of these meetings, sometimes there's so much science, so many hotline sessions and late breaking. You know, we, we thought we'd try to highlight things that kind of interest us, interest, interested us and made us think about the things that may matter the most to our patients and maybe to the practitioners that hear about it. Christine, you want to start us off? I think there were some interesting atrial fibrillation studies that were probably close to your heart as an electrophysiologist. Um, things that you thought were interesting? I think one of the very interesting studies is alone AF, um, which is really getting at a question that we as electrophysiologists and cardiologists are always dealing with. Do you stop anticoagulation after AF ablation? Most patients would like that, but we all ha don't have the safety data yet to say that that's okay. And so this study is a small study. It's 840 patients. Um, it was done in an East Asian population. Um, and they randomized people who had been free of AF after a year of ablation, a year after ablation, and uh, randomized them to stopping their anticoagulation or not. And it was done well. Most of the people who were told to stop anticoagulation did. Um, and what was found is that there was a reduction in the primary endpoint which was a composite of stroke and bleeding. Um, you know, the, the issue is that the risk of stroke after a successful ablation is quite low. Um, and so to really prove this, uh, you probably would need a bigger study. In addition, by having it be a composite that is stroke and bleeding, it is sort of um, putting it on the side where bleeding is going to be the primary outcome. And so obviously those patients who stopped the anticoagulation are gonna have a lower risk of that. But you know, it, it talks to a clinical problem. If, if the risk of stroke is so low after a successful ablation, maybe we should not be um, you know, doing anticoagulation. So you know, there'll be larger trials coming out um, to look at this, another called OCEAN that I think is gonna be reported at some point. Um, and, uh, it, but I think, very important, particularly for this population. Yeah, a really critical question we see all the time, patients getting ablation and should they stay on anticoagulation? And historically, we've thought about it in twofold, as you highlighted, you know, just how much, obviously if they had an ablation, they're gonna have a lot less burden of AFib. And then, you know, we always had this question, what's the underlying comorbidities? Should they drive us to continue to anticoagulate? And this is a small study, but important first step, hopefully bigger data coming that will inform us. And so a really, really important study to get us thinking about this and maybe more to come this year. Well, you know, Christine, I might take your lead from there and say the other theme I saw at ESC from like the, the I'll call it the antiplatelet anticoagulation world uh, was really just a, a variety of studies that I'll try to sort of put under the, the theme of, uh, you know, stopping aspirin. You just talked about, you know, do you stop anticoagulation? And we, for many years as cardiologists, have talked so long about the importance of aspirin and really have had it as a bedrock of the stuff that we give our patients and think about after an acute MI. And there were really three, I think, important studies that were presented at the European Society of Cardiology that I'll sort of loop together and sort of give us the message. And it's interesting because it's the European Society of Cardiology and all three of these studies are sort of regional or European sort of flavors, if you will. The first that I'll talk about is called Target First AMI. And Target First AMI was 40 European centers where seven days after having a, a successful angioplasty for an MI, so a person comes in with an MI, they get an angioplasty and a stent, they were then randomized in sort of an open label fashion. And I, I apologize, not just seven days, they got the stent within seven days, and then they had DAPT or dual antiplatelet therapy for 30 days. So they tolerated dual antiplatelet therapy for 30 days, they got the stent within seven days. And at 30 days, they get randomized into one of two arms. The first arm is DAPT for 11 more months, sort of our usual care pattern, DAPT being dual antiplatelet therapy. The other randomized arm is just uh, P2I12 monotherapy. So just monotherapy with a P2I12 inhibitor. And importantly, they followed all those patients. And and this is this trend that you just highlighted where they put death, all-cause death, MI, stroke, stent thrombosis, and major bleeding together. And so that does bother me a little bit because I want to know the ischemic events. I don't want to know the bleeding events. And when the ischemic events are really low, 
the bleeding event, events dominate, and you know that dual antiplatelet therapy will do more. That primary composite was similar, 2.1 versus 2.2 percent. It's published in the New England Journal. Major bleeding was significantly more with the group. I think it was around 2.2 six versus 5.6 percent or something significant enough that makes you think that obviously DAPT after a month might not be needed but it's one study it's stented patients and it's not medically therapy uh, patients so it's important to put to put into context the next study though that kind of keeps adding to this information was called I think they called it neo mindset interestingly this is now um people that have uh, you know, a new mindset about what we're going to be doing for our PCI patients. These were acute coronary syndrome patients getting an angioplasty and a stent again. Now at four days, now not 30 days, these patients were transitioned from DAPT or staying on DAPT for 12 months to monotherapy with a potent P2I12. So they either got ticagrelor or prasugrel. And then they were again followed for death, MI, stroke, urgent revascularization, target vessel revascularization, and they also followed them for bleeding. And here again, it was really interesting and important that it showed again that there was a non-inferiority margin that was high, but they found that again that the endpoint was significantly less with patients who just got monotherapy with ticagliloprasugrel. Now, again, what you see in both these studies is that the event rates in stented patients are getting lower and lower and lower. And so what I think once once we knew in the hist historically when we had stented patients having stent thrombosis, we might not have been as good with the procedure. We might not have used IVUS as much. We might not have expanded as better. We're seeing in these, you know, STEMI or ACS patients that it's it's quite low rates, and they seem to do okay with monotherapy. The last of the three. Now, you know, we went to Brazil. We went to Forty European. We'll go to dual ACS, which was uh, United Kingdom only, and uh, it's part of you know officially not part of the European Union, but part of the European society. And certainly, um, they had sixteen thousand nine hundred patients they planned to enroll for a large outcome study that started before COVID where they were gonna randomize patients with a type one MI, so people that are having a thrombotic occlusion that they got a stent to, and they were gonna get randomized to three months of dual antiplatelet versus 12 months. So really very clean standard question, and their outcome was gonna be all cause mortality. So, you know, hard to argue with that, it's all cause mortality. Um, but unfortunately, that study that David Newby presented was stopped enrollment at 30% at because of COVID and other things, but still a large number of patients, 30% of 16,000. And again, the numbers look fairly similar. It's not exactly informative because there's a little bit more bleeding, of course, with DAPT, but there's no statistical difference in bleeding. It's not powered for that. There's no difference in, in death. It never got to the power that it needed, but the numbers are numerically very similar. So putting all of this together, I think what we are learning at the European Society is that certainly there are going to be patients that we take care of with acute MI that get a stent, where I, I, I can see the data now telling us that they're not going to all be going out to 12 months. However, we're going to look, have to look through all of those because of the limitations of how sometimes bleeding is put in and not to decide where to make that decision. And I think this gets to personalization. We're going to have to personalize those post-stent ACS patients with this data to say who's really high risk and who's not, because the event rates in most of these patients seem pretty low to be doing DAPT prolonged. Be interested in your thoughts, and then maybe as you think about personalization in other parts of the studies that you saw, Christine. Question that I've always wondered: what is the what is the mechanism that we're worried about by stopping aspirin? You know, what what is the added benefit? biologically that we think we're getting with aspirin over DAPT alone? It's a really great question, Christine. And I'll, I'll tell you, this is where I think the world is going. If I had to give a, a TED talk on as an interventionist on where's the world growing? I grew up in an antiplatelet world and I'm going to an antithrombotic world, right? And the reason I grew up in the antiplatelet world was when we invoked the stent in the coronary artery, we would get thrombosis on that stent. And we initially had you know, we used that Ticlid, right? We, we, we actually had all these other therapies before we got clopidogrel. We had warfarin, we had aspirin, we had these things where we were trying to stop that thrombosis. As we've gotten better, I think the mechanism you're thinking about, which is of course the mechanism we think about with aspirin is this antiplatelet effect, is that the plaque burden, we would always think, oh, well, if they've had an ACS, they have a high plaque burden, they may have another, you know, eruption, plaque eruption, and then they'll have platelet-rich thrombus happening. But the P2I world has, 12 inhibition has really changed that. So as the new therapeutics came through, we've now seen stronger and stronger P2Y12s and, and therapies that we've shown. We've known from even as back as Capri that uh, monotherapy with clopidogrel was slightly better than aspirin. Dual therapy 
was not even better than aspirin in chronic care for charisma 20 years ago. So, so it was mainly used in ACS from Cure to show us that out to 12 months, we saw a benefit. And it was often in the ACS stented patients. They didn't often get stenting right away. We've gotten faster at going to stents. We've opened up the vessel. So I think the, the message we're seeing is that uh, we have stronger antiplatelets. And one antiplatelet with aspirin being a weaker antiplatelet isn't adding as much as we would hope eff efficacy-wise. And there's obviously the bleeding risk. Yeah, no, that's great. So a lot of things for guideline committees to think about. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm glad I'm not on any of those because that would be pretty complicated to get through. Well, like you brought up with the personalized medicine, um, there was an interesting uh, sort of registry, a uh, randomized controlled study of personalized treatment for uh, atrial fibrillation as well, involving anticoagulation. It's called the ABCAF study. And they took this ABCAF score, which is a score that involves age, biomarkers, and, and history of atrial fibrillation to try to guide treatment strategy in patients with atrial fibrillation. So beyond Chad's VAST score. Um, what's interesting is this score was really derived in patients who actually were on anticoagulation. So it's very difficult to, I wonder, to extrapolate to a group of patients who would not be on anticoagulation. But most of the patients in this trial had actually been on anticoagulation, some had not. Um, the the, the um, this guideline-based uh, therapy uh, actually had a lower risk, standard guideline-based therapy actually had a low risk of the overall event, um, which really was a heart event, including um, stroke and, um, and heart outcomes uh, and mortality. So it, it raised a question of whether this score itself or even, you know, trying to uh, optimize anticoagulation further than what we already do with the chads Vast score, um, which we all want to do, uh, can be uh, done with the current tools that we have. Yeah, no, Christine, I think it's a, it's a great point you're making. And I think partly, at least my interpretation of that uh, trial also was that they're very good in the Nordic countries at anticoagulating patients in, in Sweden and countries like that. So, you know, it, it, with standard of care arm had a very high rate of anticoagulation for AFib. So if you standardize the other way or you try to get personalized, it, it's hard to beat really good um, standard of care. And so when the outcomes are those, it's hard. Yeah, and I think also that um, we need another intervention, right? So this is basically something that um, was shown to predict stroke in patients who are on oral anticoagulants. So treating them with more oral anticoagulants may not prevent that stroke. So, you know, maybe some trials that will be coming out about left atrial appendage closure in these circumstances. Uh, you know, are there different agents that will come along that might be more effective with less bleeding risk? Um, but really, really interesting study. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, it, it's it's important to personalize. It'll be even more important when we have other other arrows in our quiver to use, uh, whether it's my devices or other drugs. Well, I might go rapid fire on a few and then come back to you to close. Um, I'll, I'll just say, you know, we've talked a lot about antiplatelets and anticoagulation and some AFib. Um, I'll add one more from that space, but then talk a little bit about some other interesting data and processes we're seeing. So another important study was called Aquatic, um, which was out of France, where they took chronic coronary artery disease patients who were anticoagulated. So patients who had a stent that was greater than six months, they're already on oral anticoagulant. And do you have to be on aspirin? We'd already had hints from other studies, and we'd had randomized trial data from rivaroxaban and other trials in the past where I think that was out in Japan where patients who were chronically anticoagulated for AFib, if you drop the aspirin, they did better. They saw better thrombotic and bleeding events. And in fact, in aquatic, what you saw is that the rates of stent thrombosis, the rates of myocardial infarction, the rates of bleeding, uh, all of those went up and that there was clearly a hazard with continuing aspirin on patients who were on anticoagulant. So another in the dropping aspirin um, sort of story that we know about. But but the other important parts, you know, the world of cardiovascular medicine is changing quickly on blood pressure, on cardiometabolic therapies. And so some just highlights I might mention there is uh, Bactrostat was uh, presented as a study called BAX-HTN that's also in the New England Journal. Um, it's an aldosterone synthase inhibitor and a pretty promising results of, you know, fairly large drops in blood pressure on top of standard of therapy of uh, at least uh, two or three blood pressure medications. Uh, and, and so I think that's an important step. Other agents also coming. I only highlight it for our listeners because hypertension is the single most modifiable and largest uh, potential cardiovascular risk factor for us in our patient population. And for many years, we've had many uh, generic therapies that have been great, but we have many patients that are still unfortunately on two, three medications and not 
uh, control. So new agents, uh, new pathways, new potential devices or therapies will always be important in this population. And then the final thing I'll just say is a, a lot of great science coming out of Denmark, where the country has organized itself to do really interesting and important research. Uh, Dan Cavus uh, 2 was presented, which is a large screening study where they're doing population-based offering of screening, and then large uh, randomized trial with over 130,000 patients getting RSV vaccine or not, looking at again at, at lung infections and showing some efficacy there. So the ability on the population level to do science that will matter is really important and, and shows us the power of organizing in that way. Um, any other studies from your side, Christine, that you saw? You know, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the uh, VICTOR trial. Um, you know, that uh, was a large trial. Uh, I think some some of your colleagues were involved um, and uh, and showed that benefit on cardiovascular death um, versus uh, the full endpoint where you included cardiovascular hospitalizations and there wasn't a benefit. Um, love to hear what your thoughts were on as somebody who takes care of patients with heart failure and whether this would make you use it. Vera Sigwad has been it's shown in, in multiple different studies to have clinical effects that have been important for our heart failure patients. This study does bring at least an important question to mind here in that, you know, what's the, people want to understand the mechanism. What's the mechanism of how somebody um, will have a reduction in all-cause mortality, which seems pretty powerful here, in the, but, but misses its primary endpoint because the primary endpoint also includes heart failure hospitalization. So having a mortality reduction without a heart failure hospitalization, you know, there are some potential biologic mechanisms, you know, there's a, it's got some effects on nitric oxide, of course, and nitric oxide and its effect on how that might help the, the failing heart is important. I, I would have thought that you might have seen a difference than maybe ischemic versus non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and maybe others. So, you know, my, my take home, at least in, in that space is that, you know, there, there are other sort of important therapies that we've thought about what, what's old is new and what's new is old in some ways, you know, we've just talked a lot about dropping aspirin. We have these new therapies in heart failure. We have Verisigwat, which I do think will have a role in some of these patients, but the heart failure space is going to go through what the ACS and, and, and AFib space are doing. Now they have four or five heart failure therapies that are what I'll call pillars of heart failure. How do you fit in what's now being taught about digoxin? How do you fit in what's now being found about Verisigwat? So those are going to be important messages for people to think through. Um, but but in general, I think it's promising data that does make me uh, think that there's going to be these patients that uh, certainly patients that uh, who have a class two or class three heart failure that might be beneficial to get. Right now, that it is important to recognize that the primary endpoint was not met, and so we're trying to understand what the all cause mortality reduction means. But it it didn't it didn't show us the primary endpoint for that strategy. Well, it's been great talking to you about, you know, the ESC updates. I'll just tell you, you know, um, I'm excited about the science and the space that's happening. And, uh, you know, we're almost through the year, but I know the American Heart Association scientific sessions will be coming up soon. And hopefully, uh, having seen some of potentially some of the submissions, we're going to keep it quiet, but hopefully there's going to be great science coming up there too, uh, to continue this where the field is moving forward to try to touch as many people as we can to improve cardiovascular health. So thanks for joining me again, Christine. All right. Well, thank you for having me.